Yes. So welcome um, to our March webinar. Today we're going to be chatting about um, financial compliance, and we've got our uh, professor, our resident financial guru, financial compliance guru, Ali Higgs. Um, so welcome. Thanks so much for being here, Ali. Thank you. Um, my name is Kelly Rodriguez Curry, and I am the director of graduate studies here at Seattle U. Um, I am relatively new to this position, although I've been here at Seattle U for uh, many years. Um, I'm a graduate of Seattle University School of Law, and I got my master's degree here also. Um, I've got a master's in sport administration and leadership, and um, all of my sports paraphernalia in the background. Um, I'm a huge Seattle sports fan. Um, and I've got my contact information here. You're welcome to give me a call or drop me an email. Um, and I've also got this at the end, so don't worry too much about scribbling it down now. And um, just a quick agenda. We'll introduce Ali in just a moment, and then we'll chat a little bit about um, financial compliance and what financial compliance includes. We will discuss um, briefly kind of more broadly what um, financial, or excuse me, what uh, compliance and risk management and a master's in legal studies um, in that area specifically looks like and how Seattle University uh, School of Law approaches that discipline. And then next steps, if you're interested in the program, want to ask some more questions um, or apply. So Ollie, I'll let you um, take just a quick minute here and introduce yourself, highlight anything that you'd like. Great, thank you so much. So my name is Ollie Higgs. Um, I am the Director of Regulatory and Legal Affairs for the State of Washington Department of Financial Institutions. It's a very long way of saying I'm the attorney for the agency. We regulate banks, trust companies, credit unions, escrow, um, registered investment advisors, money transmission, so Google Pay, Apple Pay, you know, all of those folks. So that's what my um, primary uh, focus is, is regulatory compliance, um, but I am familiar with other types of compliance which we can talk about. Um, I teach financial privacy and cybersecurity. I also uh, taught a, a fundamental class, just a privacy class last year. And I also teach in the law school as well um, for the JD program, um, Introduction to FinTech. So um, anyways, that's what I teach. And then my education is Seattle U, so I really can't leave this place. I went here uh, for undergrad, graduated in 2002, and then I graduated from Seattle University School of Law in 2010, and now I'm teaching. So I've been here a long time as well in almost every capacity you can think of. <laughs> so thanks for right. having me You're today. getting it from all sides here today, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, let's see, that might have been me. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so I guess for this first part, we will um, just do a little bit of Q&A. And Ollie, if you could give us a brief kind of overview as to like what financial compliance is generally. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think when we think about compliance, it's like, what is that? What does that mean? And the way I try to take it from is when you're thinking of an organization, you're really looking at like audit compliance and risk management. So this program actually covers all three concepts. Um, and the last position I was in previous to this position, I was in a truly compliance role, which I was um, assisting financial institutions with compliance with regulations, policies, etc. So financial compliance really encapsulates a lot of stuff, but it also works in tandem with other areas of either a, a, a government organization, a municipality, a state, you know, like whatever entity that you work at, there's always going to be like a risk management piece, an audit piece, and then kind of a compliance piece, and then a legal piece. So they're all connected. And um, so it's hard to say what is financial compliance. Basically, you want to comply with rules and regulations, um, statutes, and then enforcement um, actions, if there are any. So, um, yeah, there's also a compliance component with your own policies and procedures at whatever entity you work at. So you want to be compliant. First of all, you want to write proper policies and procedures. Then you want your entity to comply with those policies and procedures. So this program and the way I teach my course talks about policies and procedures, talks about what the actual statutes say, um, regulatory compliance, but then also just compliance with, you know, various sundry things. So it's <laughs> compliance is a big word and it kind of encapsulates a lot, but hopefully that helps 
stratify what it is. Oh, I totally agree. I, I think you did a really good job. I think that when we talk about compliance, um, I actually come from the business side of compliance. And I think that it you know, you've got the proactive part where you're kind of like taking in some of the rules and regulations and laws and then trying to develop policies um, to comply with those. And then you've got the reactive part where you are um, triaging any missteps, maybe. Um, hopefully not, right? Hopefully yeah. you've done some risk <laughs> management, um, yeah. but occasionally things happen, so. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, compliance, there's two kinds of, cons you know, there's two ways you can comply. There's compliance with like check the box kind of compliance. And this program really focuses on like the heart of compliance, meaning like whatever the laws and the statutes and the regulations say, like we should really try to be achieving what those are putting forth instead of just kind of a check the box um, compliance culture. So that's, that's at least what I've been teaching in my classes to have that kind of compliance culture in your organization entity, wherever you work or volunteer or whatever you're involved in. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Let's see. Um, and what practices do these laws regulate in finance in the financial area when we think about like what sort of laws and regulations, what do they actually regulate? Right. So um, one thing that people get confused by, and this is what I spend a lot of my time doing in class and then also outside of class in just the world, is that we have in financial regulation, it's, it's very complex and it completely depends on what activity you're engaging in. So the way that the United States and pretty much the world regulates is by activity. So what are you doing? Are you taking deposits and making loans? You're probably a bank. And so those regulations apply. Now, if you are moving money, you are moving money from one place to another place, you're a money transmitter and those regulations apply. Now, overarching all of that are some bigger regulations that are put out by the CFPB, let's say. And there's various regulations that any entity in the financial realm probably has to, um, abide by. So let's see. So yeah, so basically, in, in, in so by when I think about what practices do these laws regulate, I'm also talking about these other pieces here. Thank you for moving the slides along. Sorry. Um, so what we're trying to do is, you know, so we're trying to regulate around deceiving behavior that distorts transaction value of securities, um, attempts to mislead, um, the appearance of public trading of securities and attempts to manipulate markets or market prices and not accurately disclosing risk of security to a client and aggressive pressuring a client aggressive pressuring a client to buy and sell securities yeah that's these are all things that are regulated through the types of activities versus and the regulations that are put in there and then there's the larger scope of federal regulations that all financial institutions have to abide by yeah i think that um it's it is a relatively good segue, right? At a high level, um, it's really about protecting people. Correct. Right? You think yes. about why then is financial compliance important? Financial compliance is so important. Um, we have to remember that everyone uses financial products. Um, you know, whether you go to a bank, whether you go to a cash, you know, you cash your check at a cash checking place. If you, um, you know, anytime you use Venmo, um, that's a financial institution and then a financial product. If you're buying a house, it's a mortgage. There's so much that um, the financial industry touches and it's really important, like we have here, that there is consumer protection and public trust in these institutions. So one of the big issues, and this is something we talk about and I talk about in my other courses is, you know, with the advent of FinTech and everything, it's really hard because there's a, those are new technologies. But from a, from a very fundamental perspective, the government is in the position of protecting the consumer, especially if they're not able to protect themselves, they're not knowledgeable, mainly, potentially, um, they're not aware of the risks. And so one of the jobs that the government has in financial compliance or regulatory compliance is to assist everyone that they are, um, their money is safe and sound and that they are not being taken advantage of and that we have healthy systems and markets and economies and places that people can trust and they can go get a loan and they're not going to be, you know, um, taken advantage of and that kind of thing. So that's kind of the role of financial compliance from a regulatory perspective. And that's why it's so important. 
Awesome. Um, and this actually, the next slide is a good segue into a question that we have in the chat. Um, the question is, um, is the focus in the program um, specifically around the financial compliance um, track on domestic market or do we chat a little bit about the um, global markets? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, right? Because there's a big, there's big, there's big pushes that are not necessarily financial in nature, but they are, they will be financials like GDPR, right? GDPR is a privacy regulation that was put out by the EU. We do not have that in the United States. Different states have that approach. So yes, in a way we discuss the federal things are happening federally, or excuse me, nationally, globally, globally, and, and, and putting it into context here. I can't really speak to how other courses are designed, although I do know there is a fair amount of um, discussion around policies, procedures, regulations that are taking place in other parts of the world, especially to compare and contrast what we are doing here in the United States. Does yeah, that and I can, question? yeah, I can speak a little bit to that too. I've um, built a couple of the, uh, I built one of the courses in the business space and um, I teach um, a couple of the courses. Um, primarily, the content is focused on the domestic markets and the domestic business space. And when we do talk about the international markets and business space, it's mostly in a comparison um, context, the way Ali um, was mentioning. And to be honest, a lot of that has to do with there's there's just so many different countries um, yeah. that to get into the global space um, and to really talk about that intelligently would be challenging to say the least. Um, the other component is that, um, you know, we could talk about the EU, right? That's a huge market that we could talk about. We could talk about Asia, but that's several markets that, um, that interfaces with. And um, each one of those markets, um, the treaties are very different. So we do talk about the big treaties, at least in one of my business courses, we talk about the, um, the, the big treaties. Um, we definitely touch on those. Um, but those um the international relationships that we have and those treaties we've seen within the last eight years or so they change relatively right. quickly sometimes uh -huh. um so i think one of the things that this program does really well um and it's something that is quite unique to this program we have a foundational core of courses that is um very much geared toward making sure that our students have the skills necessary to um, research and interpret regulations in the future. So we know that all of these regulations, whether they are national, international, um, regulatory, case law, statute, like whatever type of law you're looking at, it's going to change that's just the nature of law and you are going you know this is a two-year program and your career will span many years and in those many years these regulations are going to change and so we've really built the foundational core to give you the skills so that in 10 years 20 years 30 years you're still going to have the skills to interpret those changes and i think that that's really what um is important because Sure, we could teach you what NATO says today or what um, you know the, the trade agreements are in East Asia, but it doesn't matter if you know what they are today, if in 10 years they've changed, right? What matters is that you know throughout the course of your career how they change and how to interpret them as they change. So, um, and that those are skills that are really important. So I think that that's really where the focus is um, that will serve you well. Um, that was a very long answer to that question. <laughs> um, the other um, question that came in um, while I was getting long winded, I do that occasionally, um, was whether the program um, covers cryptocurrencies development. Um, it does not right now. It is something that we are really, really looking into. Um, and, you know, um, Ali mentioned that um, uh, that she had done a fintech course um, on the law school side. And um, we do have some subject matter experts. I mean, certainly being in Seattle, this is a um, place where we have a lot of folks in that space. Um, 
it is something that we are, we are definitely looking to build out. I'll be very honest, especially like being a sport nerd that I am, like uh, crypto and NFTs are like all the rage right now. Um, it is, to be honest, it, the challenge in building those courses right now is it is changing very, very quickly. So we could build a course and it would be obsolete by the time it was done being built. So um, I think that the value that we bring there um, is in having these foundational courses, giving you those skill sets to be able to read and interpret and research and all those things. And then the um, network that we have in Seattle allows us to bring in some really great guest speakers. Um, and sometimes those guest speakers come in during the classes. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do um, is partner with some um, organizations and bring in um, not as a part of the class, but in our off weeks or during breaks um, for our students bring in um, like a social. So we'll have a um, like an hour long like social hour and the first half hour will be a Q&A with someone in the industry in, you know, we've got healthcare industry, finance, et cetera. Um, and where you can really just interact with those people and ask them all the questions you want. And then, you know, the second half hour is just kind of a, you know, social and you can chat with your classmates that you haven't really had a chance to actually talk to because you're usually in class together, um, something like that. Um, I think that those can be really valuable for those sorts of um, really emerging and changing technologies that they're just changing so fast that building a course right now would be really, really difficult. So I don't know if that answers the question. And Do you I have thoughts like on that, Allie? I would like to make a plug um, for the <laughs> for where I work. I work for the Department of Financial Institutions, as I said. Um, I'm actually the lead for the Center for FinTech Information. Um, so if you have in, you know specific questions, I mean, I don't teach that in the classes I teach for this program, but um, we, I have a lot of stuff on the website, and I'd be happy to drop the the web page in the chat for you to just go look at if you're interested. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So. Um, these are some of the regulators that we do talk about in the program, obviously, you know, the big ones. Um, and then the states, you know, obviously states have their own um, regulatory authorities um, so many times, and certainly Ali can speak to this a little bit more um, definitively than I can, but many times those are in the way of like Consumer Protection Acts and whatnot um, at the state level. Um, and I think that is most of the slides that we had for specific to finance. I don't know if you had anything else that you wanted to add, Ellie. No, so in the course that I teach right now for um, financial privacy and cybersecurity, we take mainly like this concept of a bank and we're really looking at from just like a bank and you know how it would apply. And the regulators in that, in that space would be the Federal Reserve, the FDIC and the states, um, so that would be a very specific example, um, the Securities and Exchange Commission only really does, you know, offerings, you know, securities that are registered or exempt from registration. And they also have, you know, they kind of oversee essentially, you know, um, like not necessarily broker dealers, but yeah, like broker dealers and registered investment advisors. So it's just like, that's a different area, but it's, you know, it's all connected. I just wanted to make a comment about the slide. Thanks. Oh, no, I appreciate that. Um, let's see. Um, all right. The last kind of specific question that we had around um, financial compliance is, you know, the types of folks that might be, um, you might consider a career in financial compliance. And I might just add that this is more broadly applicable to compliance generally. Um, I think that, you know, the types of people that might enjoy this work, um, you know, are people that generally like kind of uh, thinking about risk management, um, but it is a pretty broad skill set. Uh, the, you know, prevention folks, um, people who have a relatively even temperament, um, you know, people who are a little bit meticulous and really like combing through things and documenting and policies and procedures and those sorts of things. One of the um, one of the things that I've really, I think, kind of started to approach compliance and risk management um, uh, with, or I, I think, 
what am I trying to say here? I think one of the um, things that I've gleaned from years in business is that when it comes to, um, especially in certain industries, almost any business leader is a compliance person. That's right. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're like an operations person or the VP of marketing or the, you know, VP of sales or a partnerships person or a customer service person, like every one of those functional areas has regulations that touch that space. They have um, laws. They all have ethical questions. And that requires a certain skill set to kind of think through and think about how do you want to approach that on a um, consistent basis? You know, what sorts of policies do you want to create as a business, um, even if there aren't specific rules or guidelines out there guiding you? Um, and all, you know, compliance and risk management is just a fancy way of asking for policies and procedures and guidance. So um, I think that, you know, at a very meta level, you know, any, any sort of business leader is really needs to be thinking about guidance and compliance and how they want to guide their teams. Um, and having a framework that this sort of program provides you is a really helpful resource. Yeah, I would say that from my perspective in the courses I've taught for the program, the students are much more, um, or, and it's a very good thing. I'm not, it's a very good thing. They're very meticulous, very detail, detail oriented. Um, really look at the letter of the law because it's compliance, right? So they're, you know, they also, what I've noticed is um, over time working with the students over, you know, the, the semester or term that um, their writing really gets tightened up. Um, you learn how to think like a lawyer, but it's not a law degree, you, but you think a little, when you go to law school, they teach you to think like a lawyer. They don't really teach you much else. I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> they teach you how to think like a lawyer. This program gives you a little bit of that and also helps with like the legal writing pieces of it, tightens up kind of some of these pieces, like what does the law say and how should we interpret it? Um, so I, I find that the students are much more um, really looking at the, the what does the policy say? What does the procedure say? How does that tie in with what the law says and what's the overarching policy? And um, so, yeah, I think it really appeals to people that are interested in that. Also to be in this space, you have to have kind of like, you like to figure out a puzzle because it's always not clear, right? You have to be okay with, it's not, there's not a yes or no, it's not black and white, right? Because compliance can sometimes be great. I mean, that's another idea is that this is what the law says, but this is what it meant, but you know what I mean? So there's a little bit more going on with that. So critical thinking skills, um, comfort with ambiguity. Um, so yeah, that's where I see a lot of the students are very, um, meticulous in their thinking, very methodical too. So I like working with them. Um, there is a question from Michael in the um, chat. Oh yes, let's see, is the data and cybersecurity compliance the only program for online? No, we have, um, uh, the online program is all um, compliance and risk management, but we have four different tracks. We have um, the cybersecurity, we have financial compliance, we have healthcare, compliance and um, a corporate compliance. So all four tracks. Um, and the electives are all very fluid also. So we have, um, you know, many of the healthcare compliance folks will often take um, one of the corporate compliance um, electives just to kind of like round out that sort of um, uh, expertise, you know, our uh, financial compliance folks will often take one of the cybersecurity compliance um, electives. So um, you get a lot of choice in that area. All right. Um, you know, just some kind of general notes about the degree itself. Um, you know, we find that the um, MLS in compliance and risk management, you know, it's for um, students who are interested in it are um, often looking to advance their career, but sometimes it's really for students who are looking to kind of find that deeper understanding. Um, when Ollie was mentioning that, you know, it's trying to figure out the puzzle piece, like what is the, um, you know, what is the regulation saying? 
how are they wording it? What do they actually mean? Um, the way I talk about that sort of ambiguity is often when you're making a business decision, you've got kind of like three different answers that you have to find a way to fit together. And the three answers are usually there's an economic answer, right? Here's the, the P&L, the, the profit and loss statement will tell you what answer it wants. <clears throat> the legal answer, there's usually a, a case or a regulation that tells you what legal answer it wants. And then there's your moral compass. There's an ethical answer. And somewhere between those three, you have to decide what is right for you as a business leader. And as you know, Seattle U, I think one of the things that we do really well is help our students really dig deep and have um, sometimes often challenging conversations around where they want to um, find that answer. And it's gonna be different for everyone. Um, and I think that when we look, when we talk about you know seeking that kind of deeper understanding around like well you know most business leaders they understand the the economic answer and they have a general understanding of like what their moral compass in their head you know the ethical dilemma um, but that legal piece you know that lens is um, something that unless they are a lawyer or unless they have spent a lot of time with the law a lot of business leaders don't come to the table with that answer. They don't have that framework. So the MLS definitely brings that lens to, um, to that decision-making process. Um, and it's a really, really valuable lens. Um, why, why do you do it? Because it is an unbelievably valuable lens. It really, really is so helpful. Um, and organizations increasingly, um, I don't see a world where we have a less regulated uh, industry ever. You know, I think every industry is only going to be more regulated in some way or another. Um, and I think organizations really need trusted um, people, um, trusted and informed people working for them to really identify, assess um, not just risks, um, but lots of things. Um, so I think that the MLS really provides that extra layer in a really valuable way. Um, and how we do it, um, one of, like I said, I've mentioned it a couple of times, the way that Seattle U approaches this, um, that foundational core, um, it's four courses that are required for each uh, student. And it's something that is very unique in our program. Not a lot of programs um, have more than one or two courses that are required. And it's, in my view, it's, it's absolutely key. That's what's going to make this degree valuable in 20 years, as much as it is in three years. Um, it's one thing to learn the law as it is today. It's another thing entirely to learn it as it is or learn how to figure it out in 20 years, learn how to research it, learn where to find it, learn how to analyze it. Um, so I think that that's, that foundational core is huge. Um, let's see. Yeah, I guess just to add on to that, mm -hmm. um, whenever I've um, trained anybody, like just in my professional life, um, especially being in regulatory compliance, just specifically to that, um, you never need to know everything, right? You don't have to know. And actually, you should be wary of people that know things chapter and verse. Um, so the, the concept is, is that you should know where to look, right? And that's what this program really helps with is where do you look to find the answers? Where can I, where can I maybe go research? Like, what are some good tools? So um, just wanted to add on to that one piece. Yes, sorry, I like didn't realize that I was also jumping around slides as I'm like trying to answer questions in the chat. Um, so yeah, no, I think um, that is huge. Um, so taking, you know, a deeper uh, look at why Seattle U, um, you know, we already kind of harped on the uh, foundational core. It is really, it wasn't until I stepped into this role specifically that I realized how unique that um, those required courses really are to this program, um, and why, I mean, once I realized it, it's, I, I can tell you why they're so important. Um, I mean, it's, it's obvious to me, but it's really, it is truly unique. So beyond that though, um, 
Seattle U, I mean, we have unbelievable access to an amazing group of um, practitioners in ethics and compliance and risk management. I mean, it, it like goes without saying, right? The, the fact that Ali is the lawyer for the regulatory authority of the state in this space. Um, we are so lucky to have you here, Ali, um, and an alum of the school. Um, and I mean, we have, um, you know, heads of compliance for um, multi-million dollar companies teaching in this program, in other tracks, um, in other courses. Um, we really do have an unbelievable uh, group of faculty. Um, almost all of our faculty are featured on the website, so you can go look them up. Um, and we're lucky enough to be able to pull not only from um, the Seattle area, but because we're an online program, we've got faculty all over the country and we are continuing to um, you know, pull in faculty from all over. And it's absolutely, it's fantastic. Um, we are just lucky to be, to be able to work, work with some of the best of the best. Um, again, benefit from the foundation that we've created in the curriculum and um, the leadership here, I think that, you know, we've kind of both talked about it, but we really do push our students to think critically about how we are creating compliance, how we're approaching compliance um, and how we're, how we're thinking through those critical decisions. Um, let's see, there is a list of the courses on the website. Um, I think that it's under program courses. If you go through there, there's like a list of the required courses and then some electives. Um, and we are, we just added one elective this summer, this coming summer, we are adding another elective um, in the spring. Uh, it will go into our corporate compliance track. And then we are slating some other, we've got some other electives coming uh, that I am not privy to say anything about, but they're coming and I'm excited. Um, in addition to some of the FinTech stuff that we're thinking about. Um, so let's see, upcoming dates, um, for those of you interested, um, and I know we're a little bit ahead of time, so I'm happy to hang on and answer questions and whatnot. Um, we have our application deadline is June 6th. Um, so coming up here, we've got another webinar, um, with some student information and then our May webinar, the date is not set yet, but our May webinar will be going over the application and um, scholarship information. So well ahead of the um, application deadline, um, but the application deadline, June 6th, and then our classes begin um, September 6th. And they we are on a semester program and it's a little bit of a shortened semester. So it's just shy of a full semester, but it is semester. And let's see the questions, deadlines available for the following semester. Um, I believe, don't quote me on it, I think it's November. I think, I think it's no, like early November, um, not certain. And happy to open it up for questions. Ali, I'm sure that you have had like a truncated lunch break already. So feel free to hop off whenever you need to, but I really, really appreciate your time. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has about yeah. my course or financial compliance. I think there's a real need for this um, complaints professionals. I, I always get people asking me questions like, well, do you know anybody in this area that can help? And so it's, it's a growth industry for sure, especially in the financial world. So um, that's all. We're so hearing that across the board in yeah. all of our tracks, healthcare, finance, yeah. Yeah, it's just so complex. The laws are complex and they need smart people like you to interpret them for, <laughs> for them. So um, if you don't have any other questions, I will just jump off. Thank you so much for having me and good luck to everybody um, <laughs> enjoying the program. Yeah, of course. Unless there's any questions. I don't okay, There's see. one. Let's see. Let me see if I can go ahead, Shelby. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, um, well, thank you for this. This is, this is super useful. I 
I kind of had a good idea what the program involved, but I was still trying to help determine if it was good for me. Um, I am already a compliance professional um, in, in the RIA space, so familiar with, with you and your department. Um, but I am curious if like for the subject matter of our, uh, maybe specifically to the capstone um, assignments, um, are we like how much freedom is there in you know what we're allowed to to use for projects and things like that? Just because I, you know, I do of course have experience and therefore like a specialty in this one kind of corner of mm -hmm. of the industry and what I already do. So that that's my question. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so you have a lot of freedom. Um, the one, uh, it's probably easier for me to talk about like what you can't do. Um, sure. So the, the only real restrictions are that you cannot do something that is specifically tied to your work that would like be work product. Work products, got for. it. Yep. Yeah, um, yep. and that has um, to do with just not being able to get paid for like the schoolwork. Sure. Um, but outside of that, so we have some people that write papers um, and that's kind of a traditional research capstone. Um, we have some people that create like websites or create um, apps or resources. I mean, you really have a lot of flexibility. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really cool project. Um, I would encourage you to um, tune in next month and I can get you the date if I am quick on my feet here. Um, April 26th, um, we are going to have our, one of our recent graduates uh, discuss her capstone project. And okay. um, she's gonna be chatting She's going to be on with um, one of our faculty members who was the advisor for the capstone, and that would be a really good question for them. They'll be able to give you a little bit more detail, but um, yeah, I mean, there is a lot of freedom. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. That's good to hear. And then I guess sort of to follow up on that, um, from your perspective, Ali, how like, do you just personally, do you think this would be a good move for me to to like take the step and get this degree. Um, I do, you know, compliance mainly for investment advisors. Um, I work for XY Planning Network, who I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you've heard of. Um, okay. we, we do a lot with, with your office and registering, um, registering investment advisors and getting them through audits and stuff like that. So, um, you know, as a consultant for someone who helps a lot of different kinds of firms in a lot of different places, you know, both SEC and state registered. Mm -hmm. um, like, I feel like it would be good for me, but do you agree? Oh yeah. I think it's a good degree. I, I know specifically in my last cohort, not this one, but the one before, maybe it was two ago. Um, they were really, the, the student only had an undergrad degree and um, really was going to be moving up into a very senior level management, um, but really needed some more letters behind their name essentially. And, sure. and so chose this program as a way to do that because it was online, it was flexible yeah. in that respect. And it was, it assisted her in the ability to be a very high level executive at her company. So I do think it's helpful for those, if for that reason, I don't, wouldn't say that's the only reason, um, but I do think it helps you get, you know, sharpen those compliance skills sharpen things you already know. You would also be a really good resource to other students that are learning compliance. Maybe that's not, hasn't been their focus. Maybe they're more of an audit person or, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, but I do think it's a valuable program. I think it can help um, network, you know, with other students potentially. And, um, and I do think it just adds a little bit more, you know, credence because there's, this is a unique program, you know, mm -hmm. like a, master's in compliance, right? In respect. Yeah, this was, this was kind of the, oh, as, as Kelly was saying before, this was the only one I could really find that had the specialty in this, you know, I could find other MLS programs, but um, they weren't so specific to what, to what I'm already doing. And so that's, that's what appealed to me. So thank you. Thank you both. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thanks for your question. And feel free to reach out if you have other questions. One of sure. our recent graduates, um, said something really interesting to me um, 
she she said it to our marketing team on a meeting that was um she said that what surprised her the most was that she didn't realize it was going to be so law focused which was kind of like mm-hmm. she she was like it seems so silly in hindsight but i mean i i think on the one hand it made me feel really good that she's like well of course it was because it's in a law school and it's a master in legal studies <laughs> but i think that people think that it's because it's online and because it's um you know it, it's not a law degree right like in a it's not a jd um mm-hmm. that it's not going to be as law focused and i um i think that it really is right i mean sure the difference is that you don't practice the law or that you can't sit for a bar exam but right. but that's kind of what appeals to me about it exactly <laughs> right for a lot of people increasingly more and more i mean i don't practice law right yeah. not in a traditional sense and there's plenty of people who don't right um, yeah. but in you know that foundational core that i keep harping on and talking about those are the same types of classes that i took as a law student, right? Like you learn to read the law and write about the law in the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really important. Good, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh yes, let's see. Go ahead, Jonathan. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Hi. Um, so kind of follow up on the question that I asked you in the Q&A. Um, mm-hmm. So I do have a master's already in strictly just cybersecurity. So I did take, I did have to take courses in governance and risk and compliance as two separate courses, but it's also factored in with like traditional cybersecurity, like IT management and stuff like that. So that's where I was coming from with you of like, I have a master's already and didn't know where to even because I currently I work for a global cybersecurity firm as a train a product trainer. Um, so but my I love risk and compliance. And so that's where I want to go, but I don't even know where to start to because everywhere I try to even get my foot in the door, they're like, you have no experience in anything with that. So didn't know your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a tough question. Um <laughs> I mean, I think that, I mean, I think your question earlier was around, um, you know, uh, would it require, you know, would getting your foot in the door require, you know, a master's in compliance or would it be like a certificate program? And I'm not familiar with any certificate programs, so it's hard for me to even compare. Right. I was also a certificate. I also meant like um, certifications along the lines of like, um, certified information security auditor or something like that would that be a more traditional track or have talking to people in the industry is that where people are more looking towards is actually having somebody to understand the legal side of it to get their foot in the door i'm not sure that i'm super qualified to answer (laughs) that question for you and that's not because I, i mean I mean, my answer would be, of course, you need an MLS in compliance, right? Like, right. Um, right. <laughs> but no, I mean, truthfully, like, I think that you're better, you're going to get a better answer from, um, from somebody who you're, you want to hire you. I mean, like, if I'm putting on my career advising hat, I would say you should be networking your pants off and, no. you know, like making coffee, um, informational coffee uh, you know, meetups with, um, people that you have jobs that you want. And I would ask them and I would be very direct, but that's, I mean, I'm just a really direct person. So, um, I don't know. I mean, that's just kind of like my, what my gut says, right. I think that they would be really honest with you. I think. Right. No, that makes sense. I appreciate it. And you should get an MLS in compliance. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope that that's helpful. I hope that you get the answers that are the right ones for you. I really do. I mean, I would love to like chat with you more about why I think our program is great. But at the end of the day, I really think that everybody, like you should end up with where you 
wherever is right for you, for sure. Right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, of course, of course. Let's see. Anybody else have questions? Well, I am happy to hang out if anybody has any, um, you know, last few questions or my contact information is right here. Um, Ali, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who came to the webinar today and have a wonderful rest of your week. Yeah. And I will sign off now. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ali. Bye-bye. I really am happy to hang out if anyone has any last minute questions, but otherwise you're welcome to sign off whenever. All right, well, not seeing any more questions. I hope you all have a really great week. Thanks again.